Today in Studio 4, before Santa shimmies down the chimney, marvelous award-winning mixologist David Walla Woodnick shakes up some Christmas cocktails using some of his new zesty moves. And food guru Jamie Ma, who is an expert on what we eat, how we eat it, and where we should eat, comes in to help us dine out with passion and precision during the holidays. And to begin the hour, we meet an artist, biologist, geologist who combines his passion for the environment, social activism, and art using gorillas as his muse. Stay with us to meet Jeff Whiting, president and founder of Artists for Conservation. Many visual and performing artists today use their artistic talents to help us achieve a sustainable future. Jeff Whiting is part of a global artistic movement that inspires us to preserve and sustain our natural heritage. He's a social entrepreneur with a degree in biology and geology, and he is an artist. It is my pleasure to welcome Jeff Whiting to Studio 4 to tell us more. Thank you for having me. An eclectic background you have, biology, geology, art, activism, anything else I should know? <laughs> oh, that, that sums it up. Technology, I suppose, is another one of my, my weak points, but uh, I I've, I've seem to have found my way into trying to combine all of these. It's been a lifelong challenge, mm. I suppose, but never bored. Never bored, managed to do it. So what is the vision or the mission? of uh, Artists for Conservation? Our, well, our mission is to support wildlife and habitat conservation and environmental education uh, through art, in, in essence. And the vision really is to, to coalesce this, this, this talent, this enormous pool of talent that's out there, uh, artistically, of artists who are so passionate about the environment. Now, th there are many artists who uh, have acted for decades uh, in support of uh, the environmental causes mm -hmm. and conservation, but uh, there was never really a body to bring it all together and my view and I, I guess my feeling is that the, uh, the total can be greater than the sum of the parts if we get together and work together in a common initiative. Mm -hmm. Contemporary artists, photographic artists, wildlife artists, well, we have only Robert Bateman. No, no, actually well, we're a membership of 500 by invitation artists mm. from 27 countries and uh, we have famous artists such as Robert Bateman as members as well as uh, not, not as well-known artists, but uh, we share a, a commonality in that we are all passionate about the environment. Uh, we dedicate our lives through our art to the environment, and we're, we've, we're spread around the globe from 27 countries. So. Okay, and when some of you get together and go on what you call a flag expedition, where do you go? Well, our flag expeditions program is really, it's a, it's a grant program that we started in 2005. Uh, we give modest grants to artists who propose to go to areas uh, generally remote, uh, usually to study an endangered species or a threatened habitat, but we're trying to connect this, this artistic talent with some of the leading conservation scientists who are doing the frontline heroic work in the field and empowering the artists to become more effective ambassadors when they come back. They can express this through their, their artwork. Uh, and lectures, engaging with uh, students and schools and, and so forth. So we, we do two of these a year, uh, of these flag expeditions, or support two of them. And uh, most recently I joined one, and uh, I'm just back from a flag expedition that uh, was initiated by one of our members, Stephen Quinn, from the American Museum of Natural History. Mm. And uh, so we're, we're uh, coming back uh, fresh from the field with a little bit jet lag, but uh, but very excited about the things we learned and saw. And fresh from the field? Fresh from the field in Democratic Republic of Congo, which is, it's a That's beautiful, a but spot. it's a hot spot and not a very happy place when you look at all the uh, the census there's the, uh, and UN uh, mm -hmm. statistics. Uh, it's unfortunately f trailing uh, right at the at the back end of quality of life, health care, and uh, there's enormous humanitarian issues, uh, health issues, and and as a result, wildlife is ta takes the back seat. And un unfortunately, it's it's a country blessed with enormous resources or cursed, uh, arguably. But uh, one of those is uh, is the the natural history and the gorillas in uh, mm -hmm. in the national park national park that we visited. Yes, a blessing and a curse. And this uh, artist conservationist you worked with, Stephen Quinn. Tell me about him. He's American. He's an explorer. 
That's right. Well, what really, uh, uh, Steve Quinn, is he's a world expert and a world authority on museum dioramas. And a di diorama is what you see when you go into a, one of these, uh, a museum like the American Museum of Natural History, uh, recreations of a, a place in time of a, an animal or, or, or a, a habitat that is an early form of virtual reality, perhaps a century ago. Mm. And there are some spectacular dioramas on display at the American Museum. And what the, uh, they tell a story about the animal that they depict, but they miss a part of that story, and that is uh, that these places either no longer exist or they are under enormous pressure or the animals don't exist or the habitat's been re removed. And we are wanted to revisit this specific location that was created by a particular artist, uh, Carl Akeley, uh, nearly a century ago. And uh, to revisit this precise location, which happened to be in the Democratic Republic of Congo, to then do a painting uh, in the same location that was done uh, right. during his expedition. Uh, almost a century ago. That's right. So, it, you know. Well, Carl Akeley's obviously gone. <laughs> He's gone. We, we met his grave. He, his, uh, one of our, our goals was to actually see his grave. He died on that expedition in 1926. Uh, we camped uh, within 100 feet of where he was buried. So wow. How did you find it? We found it. It, it was known. We knew the general area uh, f where a famous uh, scientist, George Schaller, had set up mm. camp in the 60s. Well, uh, Schaller worked with Fossey. Yes. He, he, was, he uh, preceded his work, Diane preceded Fossey, Diane Fossey's right? work. And Carl Akeley, who we, it's an amazing story we hear so little about, uh, was an artist who is largely credited for the creation of Africa's first nat national park, which now straddles uh, Congo, Rwanda, and Uganda, but was once part of the Belgian Congo. Okay. And, and uh, he was, it was largely as a result of his work that there was George Schaller and Diane Fossey were even able to mm. do their work. So, in essence, did you use his painting, Akeley's painting, to find the location? That's right. It was a treasure map. It was. I felt like I was on a tre a real life treasure hunt. You're on Survivor. That's right. No, this this was an amazing experience from that standpoint. We were heading up into high elevation. This was into altitude sickness zone in deep, thick jungle where, really, no Westerners, uh, anyone but trackers or poachers, uh, would have traveled in recent decades. Uh, and to uh, to climb up to this to find this spot, so we were relying on this 85 year old painting as our guide, plus a little bit of Google Earth uh, to give us a general idea. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how we were able to sort of zone in on a particular area, but as well the, the, tra the abilities uh, and the knowledge of the trackers in that area who are working to remove snares and reduce poaching and mm. uh, keep fight back militias in the area. Yes, I'm, I'm assuming you had a guide. We had a we we Let's worked as, we had a small army actually it was uh, the uh, the folks that we connected with the Mountain Gorilla Veterinarian Project which was an organization that's doing frontline work now to keep the gorillas alive uh, we wanted to raise the attention to what they're doing uh, but as well their counterparts in Congo the ICCN uh, really helped organize and, and mm. ensure our safety on the mountainside uh, with the uh, rangers and trackers who were fully armed I mean and uh, uh, and prepared for for un unpleasantries. Did you worry about natives or tribes or people who didn't want you there? Poachers, thieves. Well, it was it's them. Yes and no. Uh, I I felt confident w with the, certainly the the uh, the people that we're we're working with and that mm -hmm. we're looking out for, and we had to. I mean, th these were the experts in the area, and we were prepared to not go if things turn bad. So it was, it was, a, leap of, it was a leap of faith uh, to, to embark on this knowing that we, we, we might hit a dead mm -hmm. end. But we didn't and there was always a concern and there was one point in fact on the trip where uh, uh, one of the, the rangers in front of me, his eyes went saucer-like when we heard voices in the distance. Uh, which was a little disconcerting, given that I know that they had just beaten out the uh, the militias in the area, which are not a not a very friendly bunch uh, in in March. And so we were certainly hoping to avoid mm -hmm. any kind of encounters with them. And I'm sure your wife and two children said to you, Dad, now if you go to the Congo, <laughs> <laughs> try and watch your step. Yes. Uh, a mountain gorilla. Uh, how many left in the world? Well, we have approximately 700 and. 
eighty is the seven hundred forty. I think it, that's right. There was actually just a census done very recently by the Mountain Gorilla Veterinarian Project uh, that uh, uh, indicated that since two thousand and three, the last census, they've gone up by twenty some mm -hmm. percent. So I think we're at clo uh, closing in on eight hundred individuals. Had you ever encountered a gorilla before? N not like this. <laughs> Maybe the, in the zoo. On, in Rwanda, we did do a, a gorilla trek, and Steve, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Steve. Before Congo. Before Congo. Before we crossed into Congo, uh, we uh, embarked on a gorilla trek, which is is organized and and carefully prepared. And you need special permits for, but it's open to uh, to uh, to anyone who really mm -hmm. wants to go. And they bring in uh, groups, small groups for only an hour within no closer than 20 feet, as long as the gorillas agree. But the gorillas may have, uh, did and, and can approach you. So we had a full hour with a family of gorillas, uh, Silverback, this majestic Quitonda was his name, and these, this whole family of youth and adolescents or, or juveniles and, uh, and females and uh, this family group. And they were the humanity that you could see in their eyes, it really mm -hmm. was, is something that doesn't translate on film and uh, so it was an incredible experience. Must have been surreal really. It was. Steve was sketching, I was doing some uh, photographing and I was doing a little bit of filming uh, of him actually sketching, the, doing field sketching with these gorillas only several feet in front of us. So it was, an, it was an amazing experience and we certainly got the attention of the guides who were not used to having uh, someone along with a sketchbook. I'm sure not, That's but I, I don't know how much of our DNA a gorilla shares, but it's fairly high. I know that chimpanzees share like 90% or something. It's more than that, it's something like 98, is it and 98? the gorilla is, is not far behind. But uh, the, uh, we're, we're very close relatives, and when you do see them, and you see their body language and mm. their, their, uh, their vocalizations, you understand how, how close they are to. And how big they are, They're, how hairy they are. They, they are, they have, a lot of hair, and of all the, the species, or the, the three species of gorillas, they are the hairiest, they are the strongest. The, this is a cold climate that they live in, high elevations, and that's where we were camping for, for three nights. Uh, it was snowing when we arrived uh, on, uh, on our first camping night, which was a, after a seven and a half hour trek that was supposed to be mm -hmm. a three hour trek. And <laughs> right, of course. <laughs> Why was it seven hours? Uh, I guess just a, no, no particular event other than it was, uh, it took a lot longer than we anticipated. Perhaps we were going by uh, how fast the trackers might reach their destination versus us mm -hmm. who are not used to climbing high elevation. Uh, but we, we were.